things <clears throat> developed on this little credit union called the Franklin Credit Union that Larry ran, as things uh, evolved, the legislature thought it should do an investigation into whether something went wrong with the laws or whether laws needed to be changed or this or that. And as uh, their investigation got going, and I was the attorney for one of the senators, the chairman of that committee, Senator Schmidt, as things got going, strange, strange stories started floating out from from children on the streets to other places, uh, particularly some of these young kids that, that yeah, they knew Larry King, and, uh, yeah, he was a big man on campus. Uh, they had ridden with him in his private jets and to his mansion at Washington, D.C., where they had participated in sex orgies and with some of the most famous politicians and business men whose names you'd immediately recognize. Well, more and more of these stories started coming out and more strange things about Larry's credit union. As I say, uh, Larry, of course, denied this, but the stories kept getting stronger, and I was one of the first ones, I'll be honest, I was one of the first ones to say, you know, this is nonsense. Uh, these tales are so unbelievable that, that some of these people are coming forward with that uh, that they, they, they should be rejected out of hand. They just aren't, aren't, aren't credible. And then I said something else. I said, and, and if I really believed, if I really believed any of this, uh, I'd be the first one to stand up and say, hey, let's, let's do some prosecuting. Let's lock some people up. Let's correct the situation. Let's, let's get the story out. And... Uh, well, as things shaped up, make a long story short, I became convinced after a while that there really was uh, a lot of truth to these stories, and I ended up representing some of these children involved, and uh, just an ever-escalating thing on a national level, the story became basically a story of, of a very, very horrible and very large uh, uh, ring of people that, that used uh, children for drug couriers, uh, some of the most prominent names and businessmen in this country, uh, that it was being covered up and protected because some of the people involved involved high law enforcement, uh, uh, FBI people uh, wouldn't do their part because uh, some of them were involved, uh, just just one horrible thing after another. And and when, when the dust had finally settled, I went and sat down with, uh, with my very, very good friend, uh, mentor, advisor, uh, guide, a man named Bill Colby, who you folk may remember, Bill Colby used to be the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and, and he was the man I worked directly for in Vietnam. Officially, he was ambassador over there at the time, but in fact, he really was head of the CIA then, at least in Vietnam, for the Vietnam operations during the war. But anyway, uh, I sat down with Bill, and to make a long story short, Bill basically told me to get away from all this, that that it was so much bigger and so much more deadly and dangerous and where it led and what it involved than anything I ever imagined. And uh, that if I stuck around uh, trying to do something about it, I'd get myself and my family probably uh, killed or, or, or worse. And I said, well, what can I do? I can't just walk away. He said, I'll tell you what. The only way really on these kind of things, because of where it goes and what it involves, the only way... You can probably both protect yourself and try to do something about it. It may not be in the manner you want, but it's the manner it's going to have to be done eventually. You're going to have to get the national press involved in exposing these things, get it so so reported and, and so looked into that it can't be covered up because the forces you're against are just too big and too powerful for you to do them in the time you want or the way you want, and if you keep it up, you're going to end up dead. So I went home wrote the book, The Franklin Cover-Up, which pretty well details the story from A to Z. And uh, that was my beginning of involvement in, in, let's say, criticizing some elements of government and asking for some reform and trying to point out through very clear documentation some of these problems and why, why how dangerous it is if we get institutions of government corrupted. As a result of that book, and this has taken a long time to get to a simple answer to a simple question, as a result of that book, uh, received some calls and, and some attention from some groups around the country that read the book. I did not spend a penny, by the way, advertising the book, but, but it sold over 50,000 copies. As a result of that book, uh, I got contacted, for example, by some group called the, the Militia of Montana here a few years ago. And uh, when I heard what was going on with them, uh, I agreed to look into it. I thought, a bunch of nuts here that rabble-rousing, but... Done. Yeah. 
you have to understand the character of, uh, of a Bill Colby. Now, Bill Colby was raised as a Catholic, super strict. Uh, his entire life was, was rigidly following rules. Uh, he was truly this country's greatest spy master, but he also had some pretty strict rules. He saw the war he had conducted, the Cold War, as just as significant as World War II or World War I, maybe even more significant, because the things were beneath the surface most of the time as to what was occurring. It was a war conducted by the CIA and the intelligence community, and during that process, a lot of things developed and were allowed to develop necessarily, at least they thought they were necessary, that are kind of incompatible or don't work good with a free and open society. You know, covert operations and doing this. And Bill was smart enough to realize, Bill was smart enough to realize that that itself was a very danger, creating this system where you had almost a secret government, which he acknowledged had, had effectively occurred, I think, I, I think would be a fair statement. And therefore, I think he felt a certain duty to be one of those who, since he was so intimately involved in that creation, also the correcting of it and, and making sure there were, quote, constitutional safeguards and, and political safeguards and, and popular safeguards against the existence and creation and control by a secret system or set of governments there. And uh, one of the things, the primary thing Bill was doing the last years of his life, in fact, I was with him literally two weeks before his, his alleged uh, falling out of a canoe and dying. I was with him two weeks, and we, we had a very good chat. It was like, I think it was just after his 75th birthday, and he was in the best health. He had completed a physical and was in the best health ever. And I asked him, I said, Bill, what, what would you say would be the happiest five years of your life if you were going to pick a period in history, five years, maybe back during World War II when you were leading the secret attempts to, to uh, get into Germany and, or, or ahead of the CIA or what? He said, I'll tell you what, John. He said, the last five years and the next five years. And I said, wait a minute, why? Said, because, because I'm really doing what I enjoy now and even more than that, what I think can really make a difference in the world. Remember, this is the man that was over there with Yeltsin when they were having the collapse of the Russian Empire and the, the coup or push or pooch or whatever you call them. Uh, he, he was with Yeltsin, believe it or not, right when this was occurring, you know, uh, in Russia here a few years ago. Well, anyway, Bill's, what he was doing now was traveling all over the world, meeting with world leaders and, and top business leaders from around the world and giving his analysis of where we were in the world and where they were and, and how the pieces were fitting together. He was the best individual there was when it came to looking out and seeing the road of the future, what's happening, how the pieces are going to fit into place. And that's what he enjoyed, traveling all over the world, meeting with these people, giving them uh, some direction and input based on a lifetime of uh, knowing what's going on both behind the scenes and under the covers and on top of the covers and how the two sometimes fit and how they don't fit. So he was... He was in absolutely uh, the best shape he'd ever been, uh, the best mood he'd ever been, and uh, that's what he was planning to do and, and, and had been doing. And so he said, the last five years and the next five years. So here I, I'm listening to the radio and television a couple weeks later, and supposedly uh, he's violated every single rule that he followed all his life. In other words, walking out at night, canoeing, which he didn't particularly enjoy, uh, leaving his... Uh, uh, food on the table, television and computers on. Uh, come on, the man, the man never had a hair out of place. If uh, if anybody uh, followed his character, I mean, he. So when they tell me that he he goes out under these conditions, falls out of his canoe, then drowns and can't be found for ten days, and then ten days or whatever it is later, they find him in exactly the spot they've searched a thousand times, but he he wasn't found there. I say, uh huh, right. And then I say exactly what Bill always used to say, if it's done right, you'll never know who did it or why. And in this case, I, in my own mind, absolutely do not believe the man went out, fell out of his canoe <laughs> and, and drowned. Uh, and I believe that for whatever reason, uh, he was a thorn in somebody's side and... Uh, he had to be shut up, and that's what occurred.